This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, November 2, 1906, Chapters from My Autobiography by Mark Twain, Chapter 5. Susie's remark about my strong language troubles me, and I must go back to it. All through the first ten years of my married life I kept a constant and discreet watch upon my tongue while in the house, and went outside and to a distance when circumstances were too much for me, and I was obliged to seek relief. I prized my wife's respect and approval above all the rest of the human race's respect and approval. I dreaded the day when she should discover that I was but a whited sepulchre, partly freighted with suppressed language. I was so careful during ten years that I had not a doubt that my suppression had been successful. Therefore I was quite as happy in my guilt as I could have been if I had been innocent. But at last an accident exposed me. I went into the bathroom one morning to make my toilet, and carelessly left the door two or three inches ajar. It was the first time that I had ever failed to take the precaution of closing it tightly. I knew the necessity of being particular about this, because shaving was always a trying ordeal for me, and I could seldom carry it through to a finish without verbal helps. Now this time I was unprotected, but did not suspect it. I had no extraordinary trouble with my razor on this occasion, and was able to worry through with mere mutterings and growlings of an improper sort, but with nothing noisy or emphatic about them, no snapping and barking. Then I put on a shirt. My shirts are an invention of my own. They open in the back, and are buttoned there, when there are buttons. This time the button was missing. My temper jumped up several degrees in a moment, and my remarks rose accordingly, both in loudness and vigor of expression. But I was not troubled, for the bathroom door was a solid one, and I supposed it was firmly closed. I flung up the window and threw the shirt out. It fell upon the shrubbery where the people on their way to church could admire it if they wanted to. There was merely fifty feet of grass between the shirt and the passer-by. Still rumbling and thundering distantly, I put on another shirt. Again the button was absent. I augmented my language to meet the emergency, and threw that shirt out the window. I was too angry, too insane, to examine the third shirt, but put it furiously on. Again the button was absent, and that shirt followed its comrades out of the window. Then I straightened up, gathered my reserves, and let myself go like a cavalry charge. In the midst of that great assault my eye fell upon that gaping door, and I was paralyzed. It took me a good while to finish my toilet. I extended the time unnecessarily in trying to make up my mind as to what I would best do in the circumstances. I tried to hope that Mrs. Clemens was asleep, but I knew better. I could not escape by the window. It was narrow and suited only to shirts. At last I made up my mind to boldly loaf through the bedroom with the air of a person who had not been doing anything. I made half the journey successfully. I did not turn my eyes in her direction, because that would not be safe. It is very difficult to look as if you have not been doing anything when the facts are the other way, and my confidence in my performance oozed steadily out of me as I went along. I was aiming for the left-hand door, because it was furthest from my wife. It had never been opened from the day that the house was built, but it seemed a blessed refuge for me now. The bed was this one, wherein I am lying now, and dictating these histories morning after morning with so much serenity. It was this same old elaborately carved black Venetian bedstead, the most comfortable bedstead that ever was, with space enough in it for a family, and carved angels enough surmounting its twisted columns and its headboard and footboard to bring peace to the sleepers and pleasant dreams. I had to stop in the middle of the room. I hadn't the strength to go on. I believed that I was under accusing eyes, that even the carved angels were inspecting me with an unfriendly gaze. You know how it is when you are convinced that somebody behind you is looking steadily at you. You have to turn your face. You can't help it. I turned mine. The bed was placed as it is now, with the foot where the head ought to be. If it had been placed as it should have been, the high headboard would have sheltered me, but the footboard was no sufficient protection, for I could be seen over it. I was exposed. I was wholly without protection. I turned, because I couldn't help it, and my memory of what I saw is still vivid after all these years. 
Against the white pillows I saw the black head, I saw that young and beautiful face, and I saw the gracious eyes, with a something in them which I had never seen there before. They were snapping and flashing with indignation. I felt myself crumbling. I felt myself shrinking away to nothing under that accusing gaze. I stood silent under that desolating fire for as much as a minute, I should say. It seemed a very, very long time. Then my wife's lips parted, and from them issued my latest bathroom remark. The language perfect, but the expression velvety, unpractical, apprentice-like, ignorant, inexperienced, comically inadequate, absurdly weak, and unsuited to the great language. In my lifetime I had never heard anything so out of tune, so inharmonious, so incongruous, so ill-suited to each other, as were those mighty words set to that feeble music. I tried to keep from laughing, for I was a guilty person in deep need of charity and mercy. I tried to keep from bursting, and I succeeded, until she gravely said, "'There, now you know how it sounds.' Then I exploded. The air was filled with my fragments, and you could hear them whiz. I said, "'Oh, Livy, if it sounds like that, I will never do it again.' Then she had to laugh herself. Both of us broke into convulsions, and went on laughing until we were physically exhausted and spiritually reconciled. The children were present at breakfast. Clara, aged six, and Susie, eight, and the mother made a guarded remark about strong language. Guarded because she did not wish the children to suspect anything. A guarded remark which censured strong language. Both children broke out in one voice with this comment, "'Why, Mama, Papa uses it!' I was astonished. I had supposed that that secret was safe in my own breast, and that its presence had never been suspected. I asked, "'How did you know, you little rascals?' "'Oh,' they said, "'we often listen over the balusters when you are in the hall explaining things to George.' From Susie's Biography One of Papa's latest books is The Prince and the Pauper, and it is unquestionably the best book he has ever written. Some people want him to keep to his old style. Some gentlemen wrote him, I enjoyed Huckleberry Finn immensely, and I'm glad to see that you have returned to your old style. That annoyed me, that annoyed me greatly, because it troubles me. Susie was troubled by that word, and uncertain. She wrote a U above it in the proper place, but reconsidered the matter, and struck it out. To have so few people know Papa, I mean really know him, they think of Mark Twain as a humorous, joking at everything, and with a mop of reddish-brown hair which sorely needs the barber's brush, a Roman nose, short stubby mustache, a sad, careworn face, with many crow's feet, etc. That is the way people picture Papa. I have wanted Papa to write a book that would reveal something of his kind, sympathetic nature, and The Prince and the Pauper partly does it. The book is full of lovely, charming ideas, and, oh, the language, it is perfect. I think that one of the most touching scenes in it is where the pauper is riding on horseback with his nobles in the recognition procession, and he sees his mother. Oh, and then what followed? How she runs to his side when she sees him throw up his hand palm outward and is rudely pushed off by one of the king's officers, and then how the little pauper's conscience troubles him when he remembers the shameful words that were falling from his lips when she was turned from his side. I know you not, woman and how his grandeurs were stricken valueless, and his pride consumed to ashes. It is a wonderfully beautiful and touching little scene, and Papa has described it so wonderfully. I never saw a man with so much variety of feeling as Papa has. Now the Prince and the Pauper is full of touching places, but there is most always a streak of humor in them somewhere. Now in the coronation, in the stirring coronation, just after the little king has got his crown back again, Papa brings that in about the seal, where the pauper says he used the seal to crack nuts with. Oh, it is so funny and nice. Papa very seldom writes a passage without some humor in it somewhere, and I don't think he ever will. The children always helped their mother to edit my books in manuscript. She would sit on the porch at the farm and read aloud with her pencil in her hand, and the children would keep an alert and suspicious eye upon her right along, for the belief was well grounded in them that whenever she came across a particularly satisfactory passage, she would strike it out. Their suspicions were well founded. 
The passages, which were so satisfactory to them, always had an element of strength in them which sorely needed modification or expurgation, and were always sure to get it at their mother's hand. For my own entertainment, and to enjoy the protests of the children, I often abused my editor's innocent confidence. I often interlarded remarks of a studied and felicitously atrocious character purposely to achieve the children's brief delight, and then see the remorseless pencil do its fatal work. I often joined my supplications to the children's for mercy, and strung the argument out, and pretended to be in earnest. They were deceived, and so was their mother. It was three against one, and most unfair, but it was very delightful, and I could not resist the temptation. Now and then we gained the victory, and there was much rejoicing. Then I privately struck the passage out myself. It had served its purpose. It had furnished three of us with good entertainment, and in being removed from the book by me it was only suffering the fate originally intended for it. From Susie's Biography Papa was born in Missouri. His mother is Grandma Clemens, Jane Lampton Clemens, of Kentucky. Grandpa Clemens was of the FFVs of Virginia. Without doubt it was I that gave Susie that impression. I cannot imagine why, because I was never in my life much impressed by grandeurs which proceed from the accident of birth. I did not get this indifference from my mother. She was always strongly interested in the ancestry of the house. She traced her own line back to the Lamptons of Durham, England, a family which had been occupying broad lands there since Saxon times. I am not sure, but I think that those Lamptons got along without titles of nobility for eight or nine hundred years, then produced a great man three-quarters of a century ago, and broke into the peerage. My mother knew all about the Clemenses of Virginia, and loved to aggrandize them to me, but she has long been dead. There has been no one to keep those details fresh in my memory, and they have grown dim. There was a Jerry Clemens, who was a United States senator, and in his day enjoyed the usual senatorial fame, a fame which perishes whether it spring from four years' service or forty. After Jerry Clemens's fame as a senator passed away, he was still remembered for many years on account of another service which he performed. He shot old John Brown's governor wise in the hind leg in a duel. However, I am not very clear about this. It may be that Governor Wise shot him in the hind leg. However, I don't think it is important. I think that the only thing that is really important is that one of them got shot in the hind leg. It would have been better and nobler and more historical and satisfactory if both of them had got shot in the hind leg, but it is of no use for me to try to recollect history. I never had a historical mind. Let it go. Whichever way it happened, I am glad of it, and that is as much enthusiasm as I can get up for a person bearing my name. But I am forgetting the first Clemens, the one that stands furthest back towards the really original first Clemens, which was Adam from Susie's biography. Clara and I are sure that Papa played the trick on Grandma about the whipping, that is, related in the Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Hand me that switch. The switch hovered in the air. The peril was desperate. My, look behind you, Aunt. The old lady whirled around and snatched her skirts out of danger. The lad fled on the instant, scrambling up the high board fence, and disappeared over it. Then Susie says, And we know Papa played hooky all the time. And how readily would Papa pretend to be dying so as not to have to go to school? These revelations and exposures are searching, but they are just. If I am as transparent to other people as I was to Susie, I have wasted much effort in this life. Grandma couldn't make Papa go to school, so she let him go into a printing office to learn the trade. He did so, and gradually picked up enough education to enable him to do about as well as those who were more studious in early life. It is noticeable that Susie does not get overheated when she is complimenting me, but maintains a proper judicial and biographical calm. It is noticeable also, and it is to her credit as a biographer, that she distributes compliment and criticism with a fair and even hand. My mother had a good deal of trouble with me, but I think she enjoyed it. She had none at all with my brother Henry, who was two years younger than I, and I think that the unbroken monotony of his goodness and truthfulness and obedience would have been a burden to her but for the relief and variety which I furnished in the other direction. I was a tonic. I 
was valuable to her. I never thought of it before, but now I see it. I never knew Henry to do a vicious thing toward me, or toward anyone else, but he frequently did righteous ones that cost me as heavily. It was his duty to report me, when I needed reporting, and neglected to do it myself, and he was very faithful in discharging that duty. He is Sid in Tom Sawyer, but Sid was not Henry. Henry was a very much finer and better boy than ever Sid was. It was Henry who called my mother's attention to the fact that the thread with which she had sewed my collar together to keep me from going in swimming had changed color. My mother would not have discovered it but for that, and she was manifestly piqued when she recognized that that prominent bit of circumstantial evidence had escaped her sharp eye. That detail probably added a detail to my punishment. It is human. We generally visit our shortcomings on somebody else, when there is a possible excuse for it. But no matter, I took it out of Henry. There is always compensation for such as are unjustly used. I often took it out of him, sometimes as an advance payment for something which I hadn't yet done. These were occasions when the opportunity was too strong a temptation, and I had to draw on the future. I did not need to copy this idea from my mother, and probably didn't. Still, she wrought upon that principle upon occasion. If the incident of the broken sugar bowl is in Tom Sawyer, I don't remember whether it is or not, that is an example of it. Henry never stole sugar. He took it openly from the bowl. His mother knew he wouldn't take sugar when she wasn't looking, but she had her doubts about me. Not exactly doubts, either. She knew very well I would. One day, when she was not present, Henry took sugar from her prized and precious old English sugar bowl, which was an heirloom in the family and he managed to break the bowl. It was the first time I had ever had a chance to tell anything on him, and I was inexpressibly glad. I told him I was going to tell on him, and he was not disturbed. When my mother came in and saw the bowl lying on the floor in fragments, she was speechless for a minute. I allowed that silence to work. I judged it would increase the effect. I was waiting for her to ask, Who did that? so that I could fetch out my news. But it was an error of calculation. When she got through with her silence, she didn't ask anything about it. She merely gave me a crack on the skull with her thimble that I felt all the way down to my heels. Then I broke out with my injured innocence, expecting to make her very sorry that she had punished the wrong one. I expected her to do something remorseful and pathetic. I told her that I was not the one. It was Henry. But there was no upheaval. She said without emotion, it's all right. It isn't any matter. You deserve it for something you've done that I didn't know about. And if you haven't done it, why, then, you deserve it for something that you are going to do that I shan't hear about. There was a stairway outside the house which led up to the rear part of the second story. One day Henry was sent on an errand, and he took a tin bucket along. I knew he would have to ascend those stairs, so I went up and locked the door on the inside, and came down into the garden which had been newly ploughed and was rich in choice firm clods of black mold. I gathered a generous equipment of these and ambushed him. I waited till he had climbed the stairs and was near the landing and couldn't escape. Then I bombarded him with clods, which he warded off with his tin bucket the best he could, but without much success, for I was a good marksman. The clods smashing against the weatherboarding fetched my mother out to see what was the matter, and I tried to explain that I was amusing Henry. Both of them were after me in a minute, but I knew the way over that high board fence and escaped for that time. After an hour or two, when I ventured back, there was no one around, and I thought the incident was closed. But it was not. Henry was ambushing me. With an unusually competent aim for him, he landed a stone on the side of my head which raised a bump there that felt like the Matterhorn. I carried it to my mother straightway for sympathy, but she was not strongly moved. It seemed to be her idea that incidents like this would eventually reform me if I harvested enough of them. So the matter was only educational. I had had a sterner view of it than that before. It was not right to give the cat the painkiller, I realize it now. I would not repeat it in these days. But in those Tom Sawyer days it was a great and sincere satisfaction to me to see Peter perform under its influence. And if actions do speak as loud as words, he took as much interest in it as I did. It was a most detestable medicine, Perry Davis's painkiller. Mr. Pavey's negro man, who was a person of good judgment and a considerable curiosity, wanted to sample it, 
and I let him. It was his opinion that it was made of hell-fire. Those were the cholera days of forty-nine. The people along the Mississippi were paralyzed with fear. Those who could run away did it, and many died of fright in the flight. Fright killed three persons where the cholera killed one. Those who couldn't flee kept themselves drenched with cholera preventives, and my mother chose Perry Davis's painkiller for me. She was not distressed about herself. She avoided that kind of preventive. But she made me promise to take a teaspoonful of painkiller every day. Originally it was my intention to keep the promise, but at that time I didn't know as much about painkiller as I knew after my first experiment with it. She didn't watch Henry's bottle. She could trust Henry. But she marked my bottle with a pencil, on the label, every day, and examined it to see if the teaspoonful had been removed. The floor was not carpeted. It had cracks in it, and I fed the painkiller to the cracks with very good results. No cholera occurred down below. It was upon one of these occasions that that friendly cat came waving his tail and supplicating for painkiller, which he got, and then went into those hysterics which ended with his colliding with all the furniture in the room, and finally going out of the open window and carrying the flower-pots with him, just in time for my mother to arrive and look over her glasses in petrified astonishment and say, "'What in the world is the matter with Peter?' I don't remember what my explanation was, but if it is recorded in that book it may not be the right one. Whenever my conduct was of such exaggerated impropriety that my mother's extemporary punishments were inadequate, she saved the matter up for Sunday, and made me go to church Sunday night, which was a penalty sometimes bearable, perhaps, but as a rule it was not, and I avoided it for the sake of my constitution. She would never believe that I had been to church until she had applied her test. She made me tell her what the text was. That was a simple matter, and caused me no trouble. I didn't have to go to church to get a text. I selected one for myself. This worked very well until one time when my text and the one furnished by a neighbor who had been to church didn't tally. After that my mother took other methods. I don't know what they were now. In those days men and boys wore rather long cloaks in the winter time. They were black, and were lined with very bright and showy Scotch plaids. One winter's night, when I was starting to church to square a crime of some kind committed during the week, I hid my cloak near the gate, and went off and played with the other boys until the church was over. Then I returned home, but in the dark I put the cloak on wrong side out, entered the room, threw the cloak aside, and then stood the usual examination. I got along very well until the temperature of the church was mentioned. My mother said, "'It must have been impossible to keep warm there on such a night.' I didn't see the art of that remark, and was foolish enough to explain that I wore my cloak all the time that I was in church. She asked if I kept it on from church home, too. I didn't see the bearing of that remark. I said that that was what I had done. She said, "'You wore it in church with that red scotch plaid outside and glaring? Didn't that attract any attention?' Of course, to continue such a dialogue would have been tedious and unprofitable, and I let it go, and took the consequences. That was about 1849. Tom Nash was a boy of my own age, the postmaster's son. The Mississippi was frozen across, and he and I went skating one night, probably without permission. I cannot see why we should go skating in the night unless without permission, for there could be no considerable amusement to be gotten out of skating at night if nobody was going to object to it. About midnight, when we were more than half a mile out towards the Illinois shore, we heard some ominous rumbling and grinding and crashing going on between us and the home side of the river. We knew what it meant. The ice was breaking up. We started for home pretty badly scared. We flew along at full speed whenever the moonlight sifting down between the clouds enabled us to tell which was ice and which was water. In the pauses we waited, started again whenever there was a good bridge of ice paused again when we came to naked water, and waited in distress until a floating vast cake should bridge that place. It took us an hour to make the trip, a trip which we made in a misery of apprehension all the time. But at last we arrived within a very brief distance of the shore. We waited again. There was another place that needed bridging. All about us the ice was plunging and grinding along and piling itself up in mountains on the shore, and the dangers were increasing, not diminishing. We grew very impatient to get to solid ground, so we started too early and went springing from cake to cake. Tom made a miscalculation and fell short. 
He got a bitter bath, but he was so close to shore that he only had to swim a stroke or two, then his feet struck hard bottom and he crawled out. I arrived a little later without accident. We had been in a drenching perspiration, and Tom's bath was a disaster for him. He took to his bed sick, and had a procession of diseases. The closing one was scarlet fever, and he came out of it stone deaf. Within a year or two speech departed, of course, but some years later he was taught to talk, after a fashion. One couldn't always make out what it was he was trying to say. Of course he could not modulate his voice, since he couldn't hear himself talk. When he supposed he was talking low and confidentially, you could hear him in Illinois. Four years ago, 1902, I was invited by the University of Missouri to come out there and receive the honorary degree of LLD. I took that opportunity to spend a week in Hannibal, a city now, a village in my day. It had been fifty-three years since Tom Nash and I had had that adventure. When I was at the railway station ready to leave Hannibal, there was a crowd of citizens there. I saw Tom Nash approaching me across a vacant space, and I walked towards him, for I recognized him at once. He was old and white-headed, but the boy of fifteen was still visible in him. He came up to me, made a trumpet of his hands at my ear, nodded his head towards the citizens, and said confidentially, in a yell like a foghorn, "'Same damn fool, Sam!' From Susie's Biography Papa was about twenty years old when he went on the Mississippi as a pilot. Just before he started on his trip, Grandma Clemens asked him to promise her, on the Bible, not to touch intoxicating liquors or swear, and he said, Yes, Mother, I will, and he kept that promise seven years when Grandma released him from it. Under the inspiring influence of that remark, what a garden of forgotten reforms rises upon my sight! Mark Twain to be continued. End of chapter 5